panel over the next 45 minutes and then we'll break into the second session of workshops. And we're very happy um, to welcome our panelists today um, from three different organizations doing three different, uh, working in different sectors. Um, and who are gonna kind of frame, uh, talk uh, with us today about the intersections that they see um, in their work um, between the poetic and the political, the spiritual, um, perhaps how we work in our everyday lives and may talk with each other and live together differently for a better world. Um, we hope that this, and we know and we trust that this panel uh, will give us a lot of fruitful information to think about and perspectives to think about as we um, go into workshops today but um, move beyond into the work uh, over the next days, weeks, months, years that we will be sharing this city together. Um, we're going to start off with uh, Reverend Mariama White Hammond. Um, he agreed to switch. Okay, good. Thank you, Jared. Right. <laughs> Thank you, panel. Yeah. Okay. We will. We will. Thank you. Um, so as we heard, Jared Hicks will be starting. He's a Bostonian resident of Dorchester and proud, proud, yes. <laughs> and a proud millennial. <laughs> he first heard of a democratic socialist, in, of the democratic socialist uh, independent Vermont senator named Bernie Sanders a few years ago and instantly became a supporter. He attended a campaign rally of over 20,000 people at the Seaport Convention Center in, the, in October 2015 and got involved knocking on doors during the New Hampshire primary. As a volunteer, he traveled to seven states over the course of several months with a merry band of fellow revolutionaries he met on the trail, attending phone banks, marches, and other events along the way. He was elected a Sanders delegate to the Democratic National Convention in Philadelphia and participated in the fight to raise issues the Democratic Party that the Democratic Party chose to ignore during the primary process. Upon returning home, he volunteered and then worked on Mike Connolly's successful state representative campaign in Woo! Cambridge <laughs> and Somerville, and went on to work for Zephyr Teachout's congressional race in New York. He is now helping to organize our revolution, Massachusetts, to continue the progressive political revolution here in the Bay State. He wants to save the world, if for nothing else than to survive until December 2019 in order to see the final Star Wars episode of the new trilogy. Yeah. Welcome, Jared. Oh my. Well, thank you, brothers and sisters, for having me here. I have some shout outs because I owe a lot of people for standing here today, excuse me for being a little emotional, but the music didn't help. Um, I actually wrote this speech uh, listening to A Change Is Gonna Come by Sam Cooke. I thought that was uh, very inspiring to me. So first off, um, as she alluded to, I, I uh, did a lot of volunteering for Senator Sanders and I want my entire volunteer team to stand and be recognized. These are the... These are the diehards that I worked with. Blood, sweat, and tears. And I'm very grateful to them. Um, I'd also like to thank Mass Peace Action for having me here, to ask, uh, for asking me to represent Our Revolution Massachusetts, um, and for everyone who organized this conference. Um, all my delegates, all my Bernie delegates, I want you all to stand up and be recognized as well. I went into the belly of the beast with these men and women in Philadelphia, and I would do it all over again. And I love them all. So thank you. Some of the brightest, just hardworking, dedicated, progressive, incredible individuals, incredible human beings. Um, and to our supporters, the people who donated to us, we had to raise a lot of money to go. It was a very expensive venture. And so to everyone who, who voted for us, we were elected delegates to the people who supported us to get there and that rallied around us as we were in that convention center in Philadelphia. Thank you, thank all of you here. And then uh, a couple people, especially, <laughs> excuse me, my mother and father are here. Oh. 
and my brother Kyle, and my brother Eric is nowhere to be found, but he's on his way. And they are the reason, better or worse, that I am the man I am today, and I'm grateful they're here. So I would like everyone, if you're able, to stand and rise right now. I'm going to borrow an exercise from the 47th annual day of mourning that I attended last week during Thanksgiving. I want everyone to turn to their left, to their right, in front of them and behind them, and I want you to hug the person around you. It's a big love fest. I love it. When you're done, take your time. Please be seated. I'm not rushing for this to end. Um, so, ladies and gentlemen, brothers and sisters, we're going to have to love and protect each other now. Yeah. Yeah. We have to protect each other. Okay? And I will be there with you every step of the way, I promise. So, um, elections matter. You know, elections matter. We have some dark times ahead, my friends. And I believe we're gonna do it together. I and so many others worked so hard all year long to prevent this exact outcome. We tried to stop this over and over and over again. And really, on election day, it was a very dark time, but I had already lost, and I lost again. A lot of us lost twice this year, and uh, it was a very painful experience. But I have some amazing people around me, and I'm very grateful for that. So, our revolution, Massachusetts. I'm gonna give you a little history, a little background. Um, this is the successor organization to Bernie Sanders' formal presidential campaign. He said that the political revolution was not about him, it was about us, and that everything would continue. The political revolution would go on with or without a Sanders presidency, and we are making that a reality right now. So we have to sustain and grow that energy captured by the campaign. And I see we've been successful because we filled the hall and we have an overflow and we have all these people on live stream. So that's very encouraging. If you go to the National Our Revolution website, there are just a few issues, just, just a very short list. TPP, dead for now, but be vigilant. Income inequality, one of the greatest threats of our time. College tuition, I can relate to that. Big money in politics, a corruptive, corrosive influence for anyone who believes in one person, one vote. Foreign policy, we have to protect the Iran deal. Peace around the world. We have to have allies and friends that we stand with in solidarity all across oppressed peoples around the world. Immigration, a lot of our uh, brown and other groups are under assault in this country. And this country has a legacy of oppression. We have to face that and be honest with it. Slavery, genocide, Japanese internment, all sorts of different ways of breaking people down and creating hopelessness and misery. And we are continuing to fight that effort all the time. That is an ongoing thing. Creating decent paying jobs. A lot of people in here I don't think are rich. You know, And not everyone wants to be rich, people just want comfort and they want stability and they want to be able to live with dignity and protect, uh, provide for themselves and their families and be, com uh, be comfortable in that, have security. Uh, a living wage to Harvard dining workers, mm -hmm. to the labor and union movement. <laughs> what an inspiration, <laughs> fighting. One of the wealthiest universities in the world, yeah. billions of dollars in endowments and they had to fight for basic wages and health insurance. Shame on Harvard. But they got them. They won. Yes. Climate change. I don't want to repeat all the great uh, climate change activists here. Uh, that is the, the greatest global threat, and we're running out of time. And I'm a millennial, and so that's on my clock. And uh, we have to uh, right the wrongs that corporations and uh, the, the 
the most destructive forces of this country have been uh, perpetrating. Racial justice, young black men and women being gunned down in the street, unarmed, unprovoked, you know, just being slain in this country. We need to be aware of that. We need to stand up for people. Puerto Rico, I don't know a whole lot about Puerto Rico, and I haven't been there, but I'd like to, and that is an island where uh, they are used to being held underfoot, where they do not have the same freedoms and the same rights. They're treated as second-class citizens. Affordable housing, I know my friend Mike Connolly, where are you, Mike? There you are, it's kind of hard to avoid you here. But Mike Connolly, Cameron to Somerville, that's one of his chief things. A very dense place, and he's working with the community there, with the residents, to make sure that developers can't have it all, and that people have a say in how they live. Women's rights, where are my women? A lot of women in here. I love this. Now, I'm a man. That bears certain advantages, certain privileges, but I'm there with you. And you know what? Because I have a mother, and I know, and I understand, and she raised me fairly well. Um, hey, you know? It goes on. It's a lifelong thing. I knew she would steal my thunder. Uh, Eight, eight, uh, I'm just gonna have to rifle through, we got a lot to go here, but. Uh, AIDS and HIV. My gay brothers and sisters, LGBTQ rights, we have to defend. Empowering tribal nations. Power to Standing Rock, power to the water protectors. Incredibly inspiring. Strengthening social security. I have a feeling that that matters to a few people in this room. And I'm right there with you. So. Prescription drug prices. I know because my mom has chronic illness. She deals with it. I know what that feels like because she feels it and I feel that too. That affects our family. And disability rights. My friends in the disability community have a saying, nothing about us without us. And we have to remember that. So some of the delegates uh, for Senator Sanders, we met in Westport, Massachusetts, close to the Cape near Fall River. Uh, before the convention to strategize and think about concrete uh, steps we could take. Maybe not to get him the nomination, but to get everything we could and to use that leverage, to use all those people around the country who supported him. Half in Massachusetts, half of the state voted for Democratic Socialist. I'm very proud of that. And so we planned, before the convention, we gathered there and we said we we're gonna meet together in the fall again. And we didn't know our revolution was coming. We didn't know what it was gonna look like after his campaign was over, but we're working on that. So uh, at the second meeting in Westport, 50 or so people, delegates plus other Sanders supporters, um, progressive organi organizers and activists, some of whom are here, uh, Democratic Socialists of America, Peace Action, 350.org, PDA, Progressive Mass, Mass Movement, uh, Neighbor to Neighbor, and others all stood in solidarity with us and said, you know, what are the next steps? What are we gonna do? And at that meeting, we created an interim coordinating committee in ICC, of which I am a part, and that's to help uh, sort of steer the ship and figure out where we're going. So our organization is pending, ORMA, or uh, Revolution Massachusetts. So what have we been doing? What have we been up to? We are working to form an inclusive, welcoming, robust, and broad-based coalition of people here at home who care deeply about this country and are ready to fight back. In developing, we have to do what the Democratic Party failed to do in this election, outreach. And to be completely fair, uh, on the Sanders campaign, there was a lack of outreach to certain communities, and that has to be remedied, and we have to be mindful of that and correct those wrongs in the future, because if we're gonna do this, we have to do it together, otherwise we will lose, and we can't afford to fail. So we need to unite the working class across race, gender, sexual orientation, religion and national origin, and as I said earlier, uh, unions. Again, where are my union brothers and sisters in here? Labor? They're gonna be a part of that. And faith-based communities with our churches. And so we have to not, I think it's very important for liberals and progressives to not fall into the trap of demonizing people the way Trump does, of treating whole groups monolithically in generalizations. Because I traveled to seven states and I talked to Trump people, and a lot of them wanted to vote for Bernie Sanders. 
They wanted Bernie Sanders. They said, well, you know, maybe I don't agree with everything he says. Maybe he's a little too lefty. Maybe his hair is a little crazy. But they said he's honest, he's decent, trustworthy man, doesn't take big money. They wanted him. So people are out there. People are out there. So when Trump, uh, I was just going to say about that, that not all Trump voters, we have to remember this, not all Trump voters are racist, sexist, homophobic, or xenophobic. Some of them are, but some of them are decent, hardworking people who have just been devastated for 40 years and do not see advancement, and the status quo was not serving them, and they weren't going to tolerate it anymore. It was a big F you to the system, to the establishment, and the Clinton campaign unfortunately symbolized that for them. So when Trump doesn't deliver on his grand promises, okay, his supporters will seek a viable alternative, and we must be that answer. One of the rays of hope is that more Americans rejected Trumpism, bigotry, misogyny, bullying, neo-fascism, vanity and greed, deception, lack of decency, fraud, and dangerous ignorance. And it breaks my heart to think uh, about the voters I talked to in my travels who uh, did not want either candidate but didn't have that choice. And I believe the country was ready for a democratic socialist to be president, an unapologetic fighter of passion, intelligence, kindness, wisdom, and integrity for the 99%. Um, a broken system, ladies and gentlemen, produces broken candidates, and that's what we're going to have to work on. Thus, the hard task comes to us to organize, mobilize, and resist all the time. We're going to have to play defense and also offense. We're going to have to demand things. We're going to have to ask for things. We're going to have to work for things because we're going to have to grow. We're going to have to play defense against the worst of the Republican assault coming and play offense because that is what is exciting about um, mm -hmm. Bernie's movement, about the progressive movement, and about what many of the people in here are, are working on, are doing. So to that end, Orma is planning a statewide meeting in central Massachusetts, in Worcester. We hope that's fair. We hope that's good for most people. And uh, that will be January 28th with the location to be determined. But we're inviting people to join us to lend their voices and perspective and everyone should have a say at the decision-making table from Jump Street. Not be invited later after everything's already been decided and planned mm -hmm. and put together. No, from the start, where it belongs. Yeah. To determine how, what we look like and how we proceed. Mm -hmm. And while our goals align with uh, National OR, National Our Revolution, our strategy will vary by state. What works in Massachusetts may not work in Florida. What works in Texas may not work in Ohio and vice versa, et cetera. Hmm. So three, what we envision ourselves doing. Democracy is hard. It's messy. If you're not vigilant, it can slip away. It requires participation. It is not a spectator sport. We are all stakeholders. We are called upon in this time to act boldly and bravely. National OR is spearheading opposition to the Dakota Access Pipeline and is out front on a number of issues. Tactics include national days of action, peaceful protest, etc. And we may engage in mass demonstrations and civil disobedience. Mm -hmm. Some people might have to get arrested. A lot of people have already gotten arrested. Mm -hmm. And we will amplify and support such efforts along with other groups. We're not here to reinvent the wheel. We're here for you and to be a place for others to come. And so what happens right now is um, we have to turn politics upside down. Because what happens now is you have uh, people who say, well, I want to run for office. I want to be mayor, senator, congressman, governor, whatever. And if they want to run, he or she builds a coalition. They build a constituency. They build a base of support that whose chief operation, whose chief focus and goal is to elect them and then re-elect them. This is a 30-second warning. Oh, God. So we're going to have to flip that on its head and draft our own people, choose among our ranks who is good, who is going to represent us, who's going to fight for the working class of every race, of every group, and that's going to be our guy or gal. And so I just want to finish by saying why I supported Senator Sanders. If I had to boil it down to two things, courage and compassion. He had the courage to fight the special interests, 
to fight the insurance companies, to fight the drug companies, to fight the fossil fuel industry, to say you can't have it all, that this is our country and this is our republic and you will not buy it. And then compassion to say and assert basic human rights like quality affordable education and quality affordable health care. We're not going to negotiate. We're not going to tiptoe around it. We're not going to ask for, you know, little reforms here and there. We want it all. We want it all because that's what humans deserve. That's what people have a right to. Thank you. So thank you very much for having me here. And um, I'm so happy I'm among family and friends. And I'm looking forward to what my co-panelists have to say. Um, thank you so much, and I will be there with you. And I hope you are there with me. Thank you. Thank you. So, I just want to address this quickly. I wore a Star Wars tie today. <laughs> the Empire Strikes Back, which is some people's favorite Star Wars film. And I thought the symbolism was great because Luke is fighting Darth Vader and it's against all odds and it's, you know, David versus Goliath. And I think that applies. I think that's thematically important. So, it's a prop. It's a prop. <laughs> Thank you very much. Thank you, Jared. That was a great segue. Welcoming uh, Mariama, Reverend Mariama White Hammond was born. Welcome first. <laughs> Mariama was born and raised in Boston. Woo! Yes. <laughs> Having been involved with Project Hip Hop, that stands for Highways into the Past, History, Organizing, and Power throughout high school and college, she became its executive director in September 2001. For her work at P Project Hip Hop, she received the 2004 Roxbury Founders Day Award. And along with youth at Project Hip Hop, received the 2005 Boston Celtics Heroes Among Us Award. Mariama is also involved with a number of organizations in Boston, including the South End Lower Roxbury Youth Workers Alliance. She received a she received a certificate in youth work through the Best Initiative Youth Worker Training and a certificate in trauma response from the, Ch the Children's Trauma Recovery Foundation. She is currently pursuing a graduate degree at the Boston University School of Theology. Did you graduate? I'm three weeks from being done. Yay. She's three weeks from being done with a graduate degree at the BU School of Theology. And we're very happy to have you here. Um. So let's see, which one is, the, is this? Which one? This one, okay. Um, so just very quickly, thank you to Mass Peace Action and to all of the groups um, um, that made this day possible. I see so many people in the room um, that I know from so many different movements and efforts, so it's great to be with you here this afternoon. Uh, I am wearing a number of different hats. I'm, I'm uh, the Minister for Ecological Justice at Bethel AME Church, and I'm um, point person for the Moral Revival in, in Massachusetts, and so I just I do wear a lot of hats. Um, so today I'm going to um, speak mostly from the perspective of ecological justice, although um, I, I do all my work intersectionally because I, I don't know of any other way to do it. Um, and I'll talk a little bit about what I be mean by ecological justice um, a little later. So um, like many of you, um, for me this is a time of taking stock a time of reflection. This Wednesday I was in um, Chicago speaking to, to an interfaith group there and um, you know, it was a moment to remember um, that I was in a very different place eight years ago. <laughs> um, but this last month has been particularly challenging for me. Um, I, I got ordained as a minister this year and <laughs> thank you. <laughs> And um, so it's only been six months that I've been officially able to perform funerals. And unfortunately, on October 28th, I performed my first funeral for a young man who was 24 um, that I knew through my work at Project Hip Hop who has become or had become a, um, a mentee of mine. His two-year-old daughter, I, I am her godmother. Um, and he was just an amazingly passionate, sometimes a little too passionate, we got into great debates. Um, and his name was J John Peterson Caesar. 
Um, and he was unfortunately gunned down um, in Roxbury um, far too soon, far too soon. Um, I think about how, you know, in his, when we were at Project Hip Hop, he memorized a portion of Dr. King's letter from Birmingham jail. I think about how I, I had in this bag to give him things fall apart, and I just didn't, didn't happen. And so I say that because it's been very real for me that even before this election, even with all the things, there's just been a lot of people that are hurting, a lot of people who should be standing in front of you and who are instead buried, a lot of young people who have amazing potential but our school system, our criminal justice system, and our society is unable to see that potential. And we're just much faster to throw them away and, and not recognize that they are the seeds of the new society we desire. So I buried him on October 28th, and then the next Wednesday, I was in Standing Rock as a group of about 500 clergy um, that came there to be in solidarity. Um, that was an intense time. And then the following Tuesday, after I had only been back a couple days, the election happened. I have to be honest, I wasn't entirely surprised. I'd been praying about it for a few weeks, and I'd gotten a sense that it wasn't going to be over. Um, but it made me think about how eight years ago I felt exactly opposite from how I feel right now. Um, I was excited. I, you know, I had knocked doors, I had do, done a lot to mobilize, and um, I felt that as a country we could be moving in a be better direction. And I need to name that after the election and after the inauguration, I went back to doing things as I'd been doing them before. And ultimately, I believe that I, like many others, missed the transformative moment because we believed that all we needed to do is get someone there. Yeah. But we didn't ask, now what do we do now that they're there? Right. How do we keep the heat on? How do we keep moving? How do we keep calling for something transformative? We did so much work to get them there, but not necessarily the work that was required to shift our society. And so I believe we are yet again in a moment Maybe not necessarily the way we would have liked it, but we are definitely in a moment. There are long-standing injustices that continue to plague us. The creation is literally groaning, telling us that this crisis is not just about some people and some places, but it is time for a shift on a planetary level. And I believe that everyone feels the angst and the dis-ease we have different understandings of where that angst and dis-ease comes from. But I actually think across the country, people feel that something is wrong, something needs to shift, something yeah. needs to change. But when we don't have transformative hope, we turn into fearful places. And as human beings, we never make our best decisions in fearful places. So I think we have just hit a moment in America where many of us have made a choice based on fearful places. Mm -hmm. And I'll just be honest, I mean, even some of us who mobilized and voted for the Democratic candidates mm -hmm. sometimes did it because we thought, well, at least it was better than the other candidate. <laughs> um, I, th I think there were some people, but many of us were not in a hopeful place in this last election. And so we have a choice. I say we have three choices, three options of how we can move forward. We can go back to business as usual and just hope that everything will pass until you know, maybe we get another chance at another election. We can let our local governments remain relatively lethargic. We can let the number of, you know, there's all this research on how Americans have fewer associations and fewer friends and communities. People don't even know their neighbors. We can allow all of that to keep continuing. Or we can go into perpetual resistance, which is what I've heard a lot of people suggesting. Um, but I, I want to remind people what it felt like 
for the last four to six years when we had people that only thing they knew is what they didn't want. And how frustrating it was to see people just shoot down any and everything and you were like, well, what do you actually <laughs> want? What is the vision? How do we move forward? And I think we are at a dangerous place for those of us who have spent any time studying Weimar Germany and how that human catastrophe came right. to be. It is dangerous when countries get increasingly divided along us versus them lines. When we feel that there is one side versus the other, in most cases, it leads to violence and conflict, not healthy conflict, dangerous and deadly conflict. So we can go just into perpetual resistance, but I want us to be aware of where I think we are in this moment, about the level of divisiveness and the level of um, tribalism that has become a, a sort of core piece of our society in this moment. Or we have the option to give birth to something new. To choose a third way, the unexpected direction. I'd like to say that I think the truth is we needed to transition anyway. As the sun sets on a way of living that is literally choking the planet, we actually need a whole new right. societal way of existing. Yeah. The reason I say I do ecological justice is because ecology is about relationships. Right. It's about learning to live with each other, as my Native Americans brothers and sisters would say, in a good way. To have relationships that are built on peace justice and love. Mm. That is what ecological justice is. And we must acknowledge that the solution to the climate crisis is not just a technical move away from fossil fuels, but a new way of living mm -hmm. and being with each other. Mm -hmm. A yes. new value for life, for all of life, for all kinds of humans, and then for even the ants outside that we probably don't want to come inside, but they actually play an important role right. in our ecosystem, and we've lost track of that. As a faith leader, um, we are entering the season of Advent, and I spend most of my time trying to get my congregation to recognize that Jesus did not come for us to buy gifts. <laughs> um, he was a Jewish man living in a time of deep yeah. oppression and dis-ease. And he did not rise up in an armed revolution, nor did he resign himself to the status quo. He embodied both hope and resistance right. through radical love. So in this season where his spirit is most often invoked, I want, us to ch I want to challenge us to reflect on what radical love really is. I want to assert that radical love is not a liberal or a conservative thing. Radical love does not divide, but it helps us to move beyond fear and apathy. Radical love looks like opening our houses of worship and offering sanctuary to those who are being targeted. In particular, it means for those of us who know what it is to live in neighborhoods where violence puts us in fear for our children's lives, it means us standing up for folks from Central America, the Middle East, East Africa, who have come to this country because they are afraid for their own children's lives. It means reestablishing a new underground railroad where one may be needed. <laughs> radical love prioritizes the needs of those who are marginalized. And radical love stands with our brothers and sisters in Standing Rock who are even now facing state oppression as they call for the country just to honor its promises. They are standing up against this black snake, this oil pipeline, and calling on us to respect the sacred gift of water. It's a precious gift from our creator. And if we don't learn to appreciate those basic building blocks of life, then we have no hope of building a new society. So radical love rejects business as usual. 
Radical love looks like community gardens that unite people in restoring our soil, reconnecting with the land, and filling our bodies with healthy and healing food. Mm. Radical love brings new life to broken people and broken places. And radical love looks like, looks like rejecting the false choice between good jobs and green energy. It stands against incineration facilities in poor neighborhoods and instead fights for energy efficiency programs that hire low-income young people. It advocates for solar projects that employ diverse electricians to install panels on every gudwara, synagogue, temple, mosque, meeting house, and church. Radical love says that we can work together to create the world we want to live in. I agree that it will be very, very soon before the it will all be beautiful becomes clear that it's just not true. <laughs> I don't know how many of you w watched uh, Trump, but his, his standard line was, it's all going to be beautiful. Um, and so today, I think it's important that we remember that while this moment seems challenging, it is not the worst that we've ever experienced. Right. It may be the worst we remember in our lifetime, but it's not the worst that has ever been. There have been many people before us who faced overwhelming odds, and they kept fa faith, and they worked in the places and spaces of their time. And while we celebrate that work, we also know that this moment requires us to deepen our commitment to each other, to the creation, and to a spirit of radical love. I invite you to think of what our Native American brothers and sisters say that we hold in our hearts the seven generations that have gone before us and the seven generations that are to come. And with that in mind, I offer you to the words of some words from the book of Hebrews. And it says, we do not belong to those who shrink back and are destroyed, but we are those who have faith and are saved. I challenge you to keep the faith to sow seeds of radical love, and to welcome all of the country in to a vision where justice rolls down like a river and righteousness like a mighty stream. This is what the creation needs. This is what this moment requires. And this is what our ancestors and future generations call us to do in this moment. Reverend Mariama getting people on their feet. Thank you. Uh, we're moving quickly through. Um, welcoming Didi Delgado. Miss Didi is our um, writer, activist, freelance journalist, and poet joining us. She is currently head of operations at the Society of Urban Poetry, SOUP a collective of artists and musicians who, whose mission statement is to help shed light on the diversity amongst creative individuals and groups across gender identity, sexual orientation, race, ethnicity, faith, ability, age, and aims to bridge the gaps between these intersectionalities. She facilitates writing workshops at the Haley House and the Dudley Cafe in Dudley Square. Currently an organizer of Black Lives Matter Cambridge, uh, Didi has served on the leadership team for the ACLU's BCPA committee and the Boston branch of the NAACP's Young Adult Committee. She is constantly on the front lines blazing pathways, creating channels, and fostering connections in support of other activists. She is the recipient of the 2015 Jack Power Stone Soup Saver Award, Savor Award, which is awarded annually to one poet that serves the Boston and Cambridge communities as a mentor while consistently providing distinguished contributions to the art of poetry. Dee Dee ha has participated in Michael Rothenberg's uh, 100,000 Poets for Change, uh, adjudicated with Boston Poet Laureate and others for the 2015 Mayor's Poetry and Prose Program, performed for various venues, such as Boston Center for Arts, Boston City Hall, Emerson College, performing under the direction of Akiba Ababa and Walter Mosley, Boston City Councilor at Large, Ayanna Presley's Jump Into Peace Initiative, and co-curated an event for Illuminus during Hub Week 2015. 
deeply passionate about her local and global community, Didi believes that poetry and activism go hand in hand. Welcome. <laughs> and she is a new mom. Thank you everyone, because my bio is so long and I think it's important to include all the work because I actually love the word intersectionality. Um, I didn't write anything, right? I just figured we could have a talk. So um, I was listening to my co-panelists and thank you, Jared, and thank you, Mariama. I love them both immensely, especially Mariama, okay. Um, okay, oh, I don't even need this then. Cool, 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 all right, awesome. So. Oh, there are people downstairs as well. Okay, can y'all hear me now? Yes. Great, all right. So um, I, I first wanna thank Mass Peace Action uh, for inviting me such a long time ago uh, to come and speak at this panel. I did tell them, I, don't, I said yeah, but probably no, um, because I knew that was like, uh, today's like the third, right? And my due date was like December 8th. So I was like, maybe, uh, you know? <laughs> So I'm here, um, I had the baby nine days ago, and um, <laughs> I'm just gonna jump right into it. Uh, the next four years, what does that look like? I'd like everyone to take five seconds to yourself and just close your eyes and think about for yourselves what the next four years looks like under a Donald Trump presidency. For some of us, that's super heavy. One of my co-panelists did say that if you um, were a Donald Trump supporter, it's very possible that you aren't racist. I'm not sure if I agree with that wholeheartedly because then we'd have to sit here and define what racism is and all these things. And we get lost, I think, a lot of times as human beings in the semantics of things. What I will say is that if someone did vote for Donald Trump, call it what you will, we have bought into and continue to buy into this idea of white supremacy. This fear that you're going to lose out or miss out on something or that America cannot possibly be great as it is right now, the melting pot, the diversity, the whatever you wanna call it. I call it just being me. A queer person will call it being them. A cash poor person will call it being them. But somehow, Donald Trump is not the problem. He's problematic, but he's not the problem. The problem is many of us who sit next to each other and we're like, oh, this is what it looks like to me, and then we're not sharing that information. Because mm -hmm. if we were sharing that information, I think it becomes a conversation piece, you know? We have to stop looking at each other as exits, right? Um, if you're talking to someone who's pan-African and you just don't understand that lens, instead of saying, you know what, that's too much, uh, I can't talk with you, we need to look at that person as an entryway. If you have a white friend who is super problematic and they're still like the family member you don't want to talk to at Thanksgiving and it's going to cause you a lot of harm to discuss with them like why they need to like get with the program, we need to stop looking at Uncle Bob and Aunt Kate as the problem, right? And an exit, like, I, I can't deal with my family. I'm not going to deal with my coworker. I'm not going to deal with my friend. Uh, because what you're doing is you're eliminating space for people who are most marginalized to have that connection, right? And be brought to the center. So when I asked you to think of what the next four years looks like to you, I want you to walk out of this room thinking about someone else. What would the next four years look like to those kind of people who never make it to the center, who we constantly label as marginalized folk? Why is there a label for marginalized folk? Because there's still a supremacy that exists. And so we could get into a discussion all day about white supremacy and what that means, and oh, privilege, and. I don't understand privilege, or I grew up white, uh, I think our commissioner said that the other day, um, that he grew up white and without anything to show for it. He had to pull himself up by the bootstraps. That's awesome, right? Uh, 
uh, but it looks a little different uh, for Billy Evans, who might be black from Dorchester, I'm just saying, right? So like we have to be very cognizant of like the systems that are in place. Um, so that's one thing I, I will ask you, I'm actually not even gonna ask, I'm gonna challenge each one of you to leave this room and go wherever you're going, right? But to remember that your humanity sitting in these seats is tied to mine, right? Thank you. I'm just checking, you know. <laughs> Don't make me do a mic check. Uh, your humanity is tied to mine. And so if you can't, if you can't make that connection, then, then the problem still isn't Donald Trump, right? And I think that we need to be very honest with ourselves during this next four years, because if we keep focusing on Donald Trump as being the problem, right, we're not gonna get very far. Uh, so since we're just gonna have a talk, right, and I didn't make a speech, I'd like to get some things off my chest, if I could. Um, the Women's March that's coming up in January. Oh, so problematic, okay. Um, so I, I, I'm not really one of those people that like to like talk about something until I know about it, right? But I feel like it's caught on, it's caught this wildfire. Like all these white women are like, yes, we are going to go march and show these people that women, misogyny did not win this. No, misogyny won the election, okay? Um, white Americans have told us today, right? And especially white women. I was looking at the CNN statistics and I was shocked. I was like, white women, I thought y'all was on Hillary's side, you know? Um, but I guess I was wrong. Uh, so, I mean, you can't say it was black women because we were out there, 94% of us, okay, right? <laughs> Just wanted to make that point. Um, but when we talk about the Women's March, and we talk about how exciting it is and how there's like this, this nuance of like new energy and you know, white folks are waking up because God damn it, we can't all be oppressed now, can we? Like, you know, I think we need to be very careful that we're still replicating the systemic problem of white women gathering everyone together and forgetting about quote unquote, the marginalized groups of people. So someone reached out to Black Lives Matter Cambridge and was like, we'd like for you to serve on this board. And I was like, for what? And they were like, oh, because we want more women of color. And I was like, well, didn't you already create an event? Don't you already have a space? You didn't want women of color because if you did, you would have women of color from day one. Black women want our equality too. Like, I, I don't know. So um, just wanted to put that out there. Um, not because I'm speaking down against it. I think that I got an email, I work for the UUA, and so I got an email that says, hey, guess what? We've hired two black women, we're good now. <laughs> it's so problematic. And I, again, when you leave here, check in with spaces. If you work for a nonprofit organization, if you are working in um, cash poor neighborhoods, right, where education is at an all time low and money is not coming into these neighborhoods and you're a part of the white demographic that's like, you know, we gotta help the kids, right? Make sure you're advocating for black women, black men, incarcerated folks to be included in these spaces because what, what, what are you working for, right? They go home to spaces like that. Um, safety pins, okay? All right, because we're talking about intersections here, right? I'd like to know, just by show of hands, because I'm all about feeling safe. Did anyone wear a safety pin here today to show their solidarity? Three or four, five, thank you, I appreciate it. I really appreciate the safety pin thought and ideology but I'm still waiting on a lot of folks in this room to rock a Black Lives Matter t-shirt, a Black Lives Matter wristband, put a Black Lives Matter bumper sticker on your car. It's such a hard conversation to have when you say Black Lives Matter, but the safety pin is supposed to absolve you somehow and be inclusive to not just black folk, now Muslim folk, queer identifying folk, we need to be very careful, because now if you're saying, I'm putting myself on the line for you, you know you have an ally in me, I'm not sure how comfortable I am speaking for myself, speaking with many, many, many folks in my own communities, especially in organizing circles. I'm not sure 
how much allyship? Are, are you just gonna write me a check? Is that the allyship with the safety pin or are you getting arrested with me? I, I need to know because my blackness is a target. My queerness is a target. My grandmother is an immigrant and she is undocumented here illegally. Target, target, target. There are so many people um, when we talk about anti-blackness that forget just because um, you know we have these intersectionalities you have to remember, yes, we're not gonna sit here and play the oppression Olympics with everyone, but it's, we have to be very cognizant. Remember what I said, my humanity is tied to yours. You can't be like, oh, you know, um, the movement for black lives, they have that one line, that one time about like divesting from Israel, um, right? But then forget the 40,000 other words we're asking to divest from, right? And so if that's what you're going off of when you say, oh, I can't support the Black Lives Matter movement because of this one sentence, instead of coming to someone in the Black Lives Matter, myself, Mary, Christian, whomever, there's like 10 of us in this room, um, and having a conversation, you've already made a decision for us. You've looked at us as an exit instead of an entryway. And we've talked about that already. So let's, let's start remembering that we're all tied to each other. The last thing I wanted to talk about is how to get through the next four years. I can sit here and complain and tell you everything I do not like. What I would like to see, thank you, I'm right on target, I love you. What I would like to see is for white folks especially and non-black people of color to uphold spaces that people of color are already upholding. I hate walking into neighborhoods, I live in Roxbury right now even though I support Black Lives Matter Cambridge and I organize with them. I hate walking into spaces where I know it was like super black, everyone's like, oh, you know, Malcolm X, he was here, this was his apartment, and now there's like a Starbucks, a Whole Foods, a Tasty Burger, everything's moving in, right? And it's not like, oh, it just happened, right? People are mobilizing every day, housing justice, education justice, anti-racism. Um, there's so many initiatives. I know that there's economic, um, there's economic and, uh, ecological justice. There's so many different intersections where black people are holding the space and I see mostly white people like, I don't know how to connect with black people. I don't know how to get those most marginalized into our group. No, why don't you go look for them? Because I guarantee you we're already doing it. And I noticed that there are an uprising of folks who are looking for ways to plug in. I heard that the surge meeting had a lot of people at it and I'm very happy that white people are finally realizing a little bit later than us uh, that you know oppression is here and it's like blatantly in your faces now and so we have to deal with that, right? But I'm asking, I'm advising, I'm challenging you to remember that there are folks in this movement who have been doing this work in these communities, Mel King, like all my elders who have been doing this work in our communities, you are in Boston, Massachusetts. Do not be a white person in Boston, Massachusetts saying I am at the forefront of social justice and change. Thank you. to our three panelists uh, for calling us to account, everyone in this room to leave, as you said, keeping our humanity in mind, keeping each other's perspectives open to our own, our own perspectives open. Um, can we clap one more time for our panelists? Thank you. So we have, we have a lot to think about, and I'm not trying to summarize it because I won't uh, be able to. I don't process that quickly. So I, I do ask um, for those who write, for those who reflect, like we have uh, all of these different perspectives to kind of tie together. And it's, I think for a lot of us, it's a lot to think about, a lot to think about our responsibility and think, thinking in a new way, <laughs> as we must call ourselves to do. Um, so creating chances for ourselves to do that, kind of forcing ourselves to do that, um, is work. 
that I need to do more of, um, speaking for myself. Uh, we're going to move into workshops now, um, 315, so we'll move quickly to the different uh, rooms. But before we do, is Gladys Vega here? Gladys? Okay. Um, Gabe, who was leading this workshop, had an injury. Um, uh, he's okay, but uh, if we can hold Gabe in our thoughts and prayers, along with many other thoughts and prayers we are holding, um, thank you. And I think that means uh, Gabe's workshop will not be taking place because there's not a leader for it. Um, Gladys Vega is here. Oh, okay. Paul, Gabe, and your thoughts and prayers, please. Uh, thank you so much, and I hope that this afternoon is fruitful, and even more so that our futures um, are as bright as we know they must be, <laughs> and they should be, um, for everyone in this city and in the world, that it be brighter. Thank you. <laughs>